Hey guys, welcome to this month's culinary hour. Um, excuse my voice, I'm getting over a touch of laryngitis, so I'm going to try to talk as loud as I can. Uh, I'm going to cover the Northwest states. This particular area, if you look on your first page of your sheet here, includes areas of Washington, Oregon, and Alaska, three states, as well as British Columbia and the southern Yukon. Uh, indigenous foods include meats, such as wild game, fowl, moose, elk, and caribou. Fish, salmon, trout, oysters, and crab, a lot of shellfish in this diet um, in the Pacific waters. Fruits, apples, pears, berries, peaches, vegetables, all types of vegetables, wheat, corn, wild mushrooms, and fiddlehead ferns. I mean, I've had fiddlehead ferns before? No. no. Right, so like a little curly on the end and something like that. Traditional dishes include roasts, um, including both domestic and gay meats, stews, bread, smoked fish, grilled fish, seafood stews, like chipino. Um, that's just basically a selfish, shellfish stew with tomato in there, some wine. Noticeable influences from the Asian and Native American traditions. Smoking fish or grilling fish on cedar planks are techniques often used in this cuisine. In larger cities such as Portland, Oregon, food carts with various ethnic fusion cuisine, such as bulgogi, burritos, you know what bulgogi is? No. It's, uh, oh, okay, um, it's a Japanese food, it's like a soy marinated beef and they uh, wrap scallions around it. So they put that kind of stuff in a burrito. So they're kind of fusing Asian together with different ethnic cultures there. Uh, deep fried sushi rolls. Japanese style hot dogs are popular. I think that's a soy based hot dog, looks like. So. Uh, since the 1980s, Northwest cuisine has begun to emphasize the use of locally produce, produced craft beer and wine. Um, there is generally an emphasis on fresh ingredients simply prepared. This last name is kind of key. Um, unlike other cuisine styles, there are various recipes for each dish with none of them to be considered more or less correct than the others. This has led to some food writers to question whether it is truly a cuisine in the traditional sense of the word. Like for instance, if you look for a particular recipe, um, for instance, Chipino, you're gonna see there's pretty much the same ingredients in most of the recipes, or cheesecake, whatever it is, but here, they can call things something, and um, nobody's gonna question it, for the most part. It's basically what you have locally in the area, so uh, they, they'll call something the poached fish like I'm making now. Uh, the poaching liquid might be totally different than what I'm making, but this is a traditional poaching dish I'm making for today. So I'm going to talk about a little bit the cooking style. Today we're not going to have any flambéing or heavy duty sautéing or anything like that. Um, we're going to cover deep poaching, which I never did before. It's a technique used uh, really for tender cuts of meat. You can deep poach tenderloin, in this case fish, when you do salmon. Um, the difference between this and shallow poaching is another technique. In shallow poaching, I'll use like a pan and put like maybe halfway up the side of the meat and um, that sauce that remains is going to be used as the sauce to serve with. In deep poaching, the meat is totally submerged in the liquid. So what you're doing is basically making a flavored uh, water with some acid and a lot of aromatics, carrots, parts of things like that, and you're going to fully submerge the meat in that liquid for about six to eight minutes. Um, we use uh, salmon today, obviously. I got wild caught salmon. Um, that fish is called anadromous. Have you heard that term before? Anadromous? It's a name given to species of fish that um, they're born in fresh water and when they hatch they live the rest of their life forgot to sea. They live all their life at sea but when it's time to end of their life or it's time to reproduce they have like this in innate geolocation thing where they go exactly where they were born, they know exactly where to go and they spawn and that's when they die and the next generation comes over. So basically they're only in fresh water at birth and close to their death. They only go there to spawn. But all their life is lived in, um, in salt water. That's what we're using today. So to get started, um, we're going to have to, second page, look at the core bouillon. I'm going to start off with five quarts of water. If you see I'm using this pan here, because um, I don't have a stainless steel saute pan, but I can't use an aluminum, sorry, aluminum pan because with the addition of acid, it's going to react with the aluminum ions. It's going to create a bitterness in your broth. So you want to use like when you have acid like tomato sauces, or you use stainless steel. Stay away from aluminum because you're going to have an ionization process with the acid, and just flavors your sauce makes it bad. Okay, after the water is added to your pan, heat up First you want to do is concentrate on what they call the aromatics. Uh, you mentioned um, shallow poaching. Yes. How does that different or similar to um, like braising? Uh, it's very similar. Um, okay. Uh, shallow poaching is usually, it's like very tender cuts of meat, braising is for like uh, more tougher cuts of meat. Like shallow poaching you can use like maybe um, like a salmon mousseline stuffed sole, very light, 
Texas flavor fish, and you're going to put in like a what they call a, a, a saut sautoise, like a saute pan with straight sides, covered with butter parchment paper, and the liquid goes like halfway through at the meat. Um, that's only going to be like about six, seven minute poach where it's braising, it can take like two or three hours sometimes, based on the cut of meat. Um, but that's usually used for um, really tender cuts of meat. This would be you know, like a fish humay, like a fish stock you use for that, a light stock, um, some more of a hearty, hardier kind of stew that you're thinking of. But, um, well, the principle is basically the same. Um, you're, the sauce that you have and any of the meat juice that are rendered become part of the final dish. It just has a very quicker process. You reserve for more tender cuts of meat. Really, it's a quick braise, really. That's all it is. Okay, so what they call aromatics. Aromatics are things like onions, carrots, and celery that give you that nice aroma to your dish. Um, I really don't have to worry about too much about being particular with equal knife cuts in this, although it should be similar because it's not going to be part of the final dish. I'm only using this to infuse the water. What you want to do is always, when you're cutting, especially around a vegetable, always get it so you get a flat side for stability. That way you don't have to worry about cutting your finger and stuff. <laughs> Once it comes to a simmer, actually, it's a good question. Once it comes to a simmer, I don't want to really overboil the one. I want to like gentle simmer for like about 20, 30 minutes on that. Um, especially when you add your fish. You never want to boil it once you put your meat in either. It'll make the fish really uh, tight. It renders too much juice out of the, of the fish. So. I'll go over that a little bit, though. Oh, actually, this is good use for your stems, too. You save like the top for your garnish. I like the parsley stems there, a lot of flavor in there. Now this one you're doing onion, I think it covered a couple times. Always start with, let me start with this one. Here's the root in your onion. You want to get that just to the surface. And you cut the blossom end off like that. You work way down, peel off the paper, paper leaves. I covered this a couple times before, but um, it's worth repeating. The root end right here, when you're going to do dices like I'm going to do, always stays intact. So I'll cut this in half. So you have half the root end. What that does, it keeps all the layers stuck together. Now if I want to do a slice, um, I'll use it in the stock anyway. If I want to do a slice, I just do a V cut and get rid of that. And that way they all separate all the way down like that. With this particular, if you're going to do a dice, Leave the root intact, like that. It's easy to manipulate. And I actually need another onion. It's going to start to smell like a stock pretty soon, you know, like that. If you look on the recipe, now we're going to the um, kind of spices. You have thyme. Bailey's, parsley stems, peppercorns, but also vinegar. I particularly like to use white vinegar in this. I like the astringency of it. So this is going to happen. When I'm adding this acid here, you got a stainless steel pan, so I'm fine. What the acid does, particularly with this type of fish, it's going to get like a sl slight sourness to the poach. This is very light anyway. When you taste the final product of the fish, you're not really going to taste too much of the poaching liquid. What that does is, it's a good counterbalance between the fat of the salmon. It's a very fatty fish. It also helps to tighten up the meat fibers when the uh, meat goes into the water. So the acid has a tendency to constrict the meat fibers. Bay leaf, parsley stems, and peppercorn. Use whole peppercorn. This is dry thyme. Bay leaf. And kosher salt. Really start to smell pretty 
pretty good now. We switch cutting boards because this is used for raw fish. I'm just going to go over the salmon that we used today. This is a whole filet of um, wild caught Pacific salmon. So basically, what you're doing is, is descaled, heads up here, tails down here. What you want to do is the belly has a lot of fat in it, it's very thin. You save this and use it for stock, whatever. And on the dorsal side, there's a thin layer of fat there too. I'm going to do a fine trim on that. And the reason I do that is because it makes it easier to de-skip in one step. Hopefully one step. So you start the tail end, work towards the head. Cut in, as soon as you get to the skin, at an angle, stop. Gently angle it and work your way down the fish, pulling on the tail. Some people can do it in like one sweep. I'm not that good at it because I don't do that much fish. But. Always pulling on the skin as you go. That comes off one side there. So you can, you can finish, finish. So basically for this, we're looking for like about five, five ounce portions. As you can see, it tapers, so you kind of eyeball it. Very tapers really thin here, and down here a little bit. So obviously, these cuts would be wider than here. Now the recipe calls for salmon tranches. Now, tranches are cut from, this was the whole side was called the filet. Basically called a subprimal, but it's called a tranche. This is a tranche. It's anywhere from like a four to six ounce portion of the whole filet cut between head and tail, okay? Now if it was a steak, if I had two filets here, cut right down through the vertebrae of the bone, that's a steak, so you get two sides of the vertebrae. There's another cut called, in fish they call cougenette, sometimes they batter fry it. This is what they call a cuisinette in French. But we use the tranches for today. So the side. Okay, basically come up to a simmer. This is a great utensil to have when you're pet poaching. You can submerge your meat in there and take, take it out as you go. It's called a spider simmer. So at this point in time, you take your fish. I accelerated that poaching, obviously, the uh, court bouillon. That would have to go for another about 20, 30 minutes, but for demo purposes, I'm just going to poach that salmon right now. So about, you're looking for about an eight minute uh, poach on that salmon. Um, and this is similar to like uh, deep fat frying or something like that, or like a, a sauteing. Sauteing is like, I covered this before, you make your sauce in the pan. Deep fat frying, you always have to have your sauce on the side. Now this being a deep poach, I cannot use really this poaching liquid as much of a sauce as too much of it. A lot of vinegar to it, so typically you add a sauce to the side. It can be hollandaise, uh, it can be anything. So today I made um, creamy leek sauce to go on top of the salmon, so you taste that. And for some Asian influence, I did a little rice and some roasted shiitake mushrooms, a little asparagus. I'll serve that on the side. So, yes, please. How much fish can you put in the in the pot? A bit. Um, you pretty much you pretty much want to estimate the surface of the bottom of the pan. It does sink; it'll be totally submerged. So you really don't want to crowd it too much. You want to have like like I'm telling you right now, I could probably do about eight to ten portions in here, comfortably in this size pan. But if I have like a big like pan like this, you do twenty, no problem. Like in a hotel restaurant, you do like pretty much Swiss braziers are really big. You can do like eight salmon at a time, you know. So it all depends on. Like, I kind of judge it by the bottom surface area of the pan that you're cooking in. As long as the meat is totally submerged. Any other questions? Yes. Did you say that was simmer? Are you yes. Or what? You don't want to. You don't want to break. Um, Break a simmer, boil the meat, and it'll tend to deflate the fish apart. Over boiling has a tendency to like to even it actually has a tendency to dry it out, get rid of like the natural oils of the fish and have like a gentle poach, along with the kind of ripples on the surface as you're looking for. Is the 
fish sink. <laughs> it does. A little sink, yep. It, it doesn't does. like swim around, right? <laughs> no, it's pretty much dead when I got it. <laughs> <laughs> That's swimming. Like I said, this is a really easy cooking method. It's good for like, um, I've poached tenderloin before. Any tender cuts of meat work really well with this. If, you have the, the, the caveat though. I mean, you have to know the meat you're cooking. I know like salmon, depending on the size of the cut. Eight minutes is tops. Um, tenderloin on the same on the size of the cup, but after that it gets tough, and you're pretty much going to render it render it out and useless. So it's very temperamental. You just got to watch it. You don't want to overcook it too much. It just gets too tough. That's all it is. Can you tell by looking at it, or you just got to go by? It? You sure can. Yeah. Um, like I could. <laughs> so I know for a fact this is about like maybe half the time. So. Based upon the time it was in here, this should only have like a surface. The surface should look like the rest should be pretty much raw, which it is like that. Um, some people actually eat their salmon like that. I mean, I'm pretty good. I have affinity to it, but I do. Um, so, like I said, that was about two minutes. So, like, once you get started on the outside, the rest cooks pretty fast once it gets in there. So, now I'm going to do a plate for you. And this particular sauce I made, um, the next demo that I'm going to cover. I haven't covered sauces that much, so um, I think we do like a demo of just sauces, like the mother sauces. So um, this is what they call bechamel. It's a milk-based sauce, thick with roux. Bay leaf, onion, touch the wine, and to that I add some um, roasted leeks. It'll be a nice foil to this fish, I think. Fresh rig of dill. Dill and salmon like are meant for each other. Like yeah, Flavor together, right? Okay. And that'd be the final fish right there. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. When can you move in? Sure. <laughs> 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 no problem. <laughs> well, like you always have your scraps because anything here would make a great stock. I'm going to make a fish stock. Um, so the fatty cap to the salmon is pretty fatty, but this would make a great fish stock right there for starters. The fish had I saved and things like that. Always save your product. You want to throw it in there. Okay, with a head on it? Um, yeah, you can, there's actually a fish head soup they call it. Make a stock out of it, yeah. <laughs> And that's another good question too. Whenever you buy your fish, I had the head, but I didn't save it. Whenever you go to like the store and buy whole fish, obviously whole is better because it's less fabricated. Okay. Whenever you look for a fish, or look for the gills. What you want to do is look for it's like be cherry red. You want any browning, anything like that? Open it up. You want to call absence of belly burn. Sometimes you have like a whole fish, and the spots on it. It means like the digestive acids have taken effect on the meat. It wasn't fabricated as soon after caught. So sometimes they'll catch these fish on the boat, and they won't eviscerate them until hours afterwards. By that time. A lot of the own digesters have already hit the meat. So you gotta look for like a really pink, nice flesh like this. No brown spots on the flesh. And the gills gotta be cherry red, but the eyes have gotta be really thick and not sunken. Sometimes you like fish in the star, sunken eyes, and they're kind of like wrinkled. You want like full eyes. Cherry gills and like absence of belly burn. No brown spots in the flesh. And that's a sign of freshness, though. So. It should smell like the ocean, too. You like the salt water, you know? But, yeah. So we'll start. Okay, no, who's gonna help me? Oh, one more quick thing I forgot to say. Yeah, I forgot one more thing. When you're making the core bouillon, I put the fish in so it's because it wasn't cooked yet. Always strain it before you add your meat, too, because I had the, I had the vegetables in there. But it wasn't cooked like because I'm still going to use that core bouillon. I had the salmon to it. But after the, after the vegetables become tender, after 30 minutes, and you strain it, then add your fish. I just put the fish in today for demonstration purposes. Always strain that broth out. So you don't have to get with all the vegetables that are in there when you serve it.
The rest. <laughs> when, you, when, you, when you put the fish in, take the vegetables and everything that you put in. Before you put your meat in, yeah. make sure that that broth that I made with all the onions, that gets strained, put it back on the oven with none of the vegetables, then you put your meat in. Because otherwise you have like raw onion pieces and carrots and parsley stems to contend with. You just want to strain that out and then use it for a portion of it. I got you. Yep. I think it's in the directors too. <laughs>